Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple, and on today's 193rd episode of The Thriller Zone, I am so pleased to welcome my buddy and a return guest to the show, Bruce Borges, along with his latest Porterbeck book, Shades of Mercy. Today, we get into all kinds of stuff. Writing? Sure. Where to find inspiration? You betcha. But we also get into some private stuff, which you can hear more of at the end of the show. Now, you may have heard about my recent bout with cancer. Well, I'm feeling very very encouraged to share that story and my journey. So if you're interested in hearing some real inside conversation, hang on until the end of the show. Oh, and stay tuned for more honest conversations about the same in the very near future, which I will share more of soon. But now let's take it away from me and give our undivided attention to Bruce Borges right here on the Thriller Zone. All right, now here's the official start to the Thriller Zone. Uh, the day before your book drops, Bruce, how excited are you, man? I'm pretty excited. Yeah, uh, definitely ready to go with number two in the Porterback series. This book, um, you know, part of the reason that you're back on the show, and I should probably explain this because I'd never talk about it. People wonder, how do certain guys get on two and three times? And, I, and, I, and I've been trying to get on your show forever and I can't get on. Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, how the stars are aligning, how I'm feeling that week, uh, the success of your book. If you're a debut author, those are kind of challenging because I have to, since I do the show for free, I have to figure out ways to make the show valuable beyond just everyone liking it so that I can get sponsors. And sponsors go, well, I don't know who that is. And so it doesn't pull any attraction to the show. So I'm in a tough place. But I really have always liked pulling in new guys like you, which was last year. Right. So you see, you see where I am, right? Sure. And it makes sense, right? Yeah. I happen to like you because you got great energy. <laughs> um, you're a smart dude. You're kind. You're gracious. And you, you write hell of a works. I mean, I loved uh, Bitter Past, The Bitter Past. And this one, you know was better <laughs> imagine that well i'm glad to hear you say that i i you know I, I don't know whether this is common among authors or not you could probably chime in here as well um the, so the bitter past was you know kind of the baby that got everything started here and i've had a lot of people tell me i think shades of mercy is actually even better and 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 to me it's like that that's kind of shocking why is that shocking? Tell me, break that down for me. Um, I was afraid, and I, again, I think this is probably a pretty common feeling, that I, I was not going to be able to recreate, reproduce, or you know, get that same kind of vibe going in any of the following books because they're, they're sequels for the most part. Mm -hmm. It's not the same story, but it's the mm -hmm. same set of characters. And I was worried that, gosh, am I going to be able to, to recreate that? And, and I just... I, it's been very nice to get that feedback already on Shades of Mercy. There's a couple things that spring to mind. You may or may not have heard my episode a couple of weeks back with Jack Carr. We're talking about his new book, The Red Sky Morning. And right. we were talking about that thing about uh, authenticity and imposter syndrome, which we both kind of called bullshit on. And sometimes I wonder, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. Sometimes I wonder, do we pull that on ourselves as kind of a false bravado or we've heard it so we feel like we should feel it when in reality, and this is what I said to Jack, I said, I call bullshit on that because there are days that I write something. I'm like, God damn, that is good. And I think yeah. we should high five ourselves yeah. metaphorically and go, uh, that was good. And you know what? Sometimes, and I'm going to stop so you can jump in here. I'm sorry. Sometimes you just got to give yourself permission and go, dude, that came out of the thin air. Right. And it resonates and it's heartfelt and it's good technique. Uh, technically, it's good. Yeah. And it's good storytelling. So I'm going to shut up. I don't want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. I uh, The only time that I really feel imposter syndrome or something akin to that is when I'm reading other authors and I stumble across a paragraph or a couple of sentences and I go, oh my God, that's magic. Why can't I do that? And then, to your point, I'm writing things oftentimes 
when I sit back and I look at it, and and you know you're you've created this world, this, this entire fake world, and you've populated it with people and buildings and all of these settings. And, and sometimes you look back at that and you go, that's really good. And you're right. You have to give yourself permission to acknowledge that and also to be able to tell other people and it, it, convey that to other people that, yeah, I, I've written a good book here. This is worth reading. And that's not easy to do for a lot of people, but because it does sometimes feel self-aggrandizing. Uh, but but it's necessary. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, had the good fortune of knowing at a very young age what I wanted to do in my life. I was about 13, 14. Yeah. I said, I'm going to be on the radio. I mean, my voice changed really early, so that kind of helped. And my dad was a preacher, so I learned elocution and storytelling from the pulpit from him. Right. But at 16, I landed my first gig because I'm like, this is what I want to do. I'm good at this. And I wasn't even good at it yet. I said, but I'm going to be good. And I practice just like we do when we write. We practice by writing. Right. And, and damned if I didn't just skyrocket one gig after another until I made it to the number one market in the country. And this is my point, not bragging, but saying you have to have a dream, hold on to it, latch on to it and let the power of that take you. And you got to do that with writing. Cause if you don't give yourself that permission and believe that will happen, now I can get all metaphysical on your ass if you want me to, but you know, the universe source, energy, whatever you want to call it, God, uh, gives you the talents. Do you think, here's an interesting thing. I'm going to go on a tirade. Do you think it's interesting that this all-powerful being goes, hey, Bruce, you're a good guy. You're talented. I'm going to give you these desires. I'm going to create these desires in you. And then you go, oh, cool. Thank you, all-powerful one. And you start working and he goes, oh, psych. I was just yeah. kidding, right? Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, it, it's funny because, you know, you talk to other people who uh, are, are trying to get into the business of writing and maybe get their first book or their first short story out or whatever, and they have those same feelings of, gosh, can I really do this? Um, and, and like you said, you, you have to be at the point where you are able to recognize within yourself that, Look, I've got some talent here. It, maybe it's not, maybe I'm not Stephen King, but I've got some abilities here and I'm going to go after this. And once you start believing that and believing you can go some places here, it's a lot easier because self-doubt can wreak havoc on you. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, a waste, it's a waste of time. It's a total waste of time. And I would say rechannel that energy to, right. you know, that old phrase, Bruce, uh, fake it until you can make it. That's right. Yeah. So, so just fake it until you can yeah. make it. Tell, tell yourself you're faking it until you're right. making it, but use whatever technique you, you need. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I can tell you this. Um, and I read probably way too many books. Uh, some, sometimes uh, my challenge on this show is I will be, I know your book. I've read your book. I know the characters, but I may be reading th this week. I was reading three simultaneously because I'm just stacking the deck. And sometimes I'm sitting down and I'll go, uh, Porter. Oh yeah. Porterback. Okay, good. Right. Yeah. Right. Let me stop babbling. I, I want to do this. As we said, it drops tomorrow. Last time I saw you, I like to get caught up. Mm -hmm. I saw you at Bowser con here in San Diego. Yep. How did you like Bowser Khan? What did you take away from Bowser Khan? Well, you know, um, I, I'm on the kind of write a book a year schedule now with my publisher. And the good news is that the Bitter Past has done well enough that my original two book deal is now a four book deal. Uh, so, so we're going to have at least four quarterback novels. Um, and that's great. And there's been a lot of extra stuff kind of surrounding that uh, contract extension. The other thing that I've been up to, unfortunately, is that my wonderful literary agent, Janet Reed, passed away. Mm. Uh, and she was, you know, an icon in this industry. And uh, she she was very, very gracious in, in taking me on back in 2020. 
and believing in me. And I learned so much from her. So now I'm, I'm trying to fill that void of, of not having an agent presently. Now, quite honestly, I'm in a good place where I'm in the middle now of this four book deal and I probably don't need an agent, you know, immediately, but, right. but I'm already, I'll, I'll tell you quite honestly, I'm missing that advice and that counsel and uh, the occasional phone call just, you know, shooting the crap with me and, and talking about the industry as a whole. So that's kind of what I've been up to. But Bowser Khan was, was great. Uh, I really, out of the conferences I've been to, it certainly has been the best. Uh, I may go to Thriller Fest next year and try that. Um, but uh, I'm definitely going back to Bowser Khan. And, and certainly the one in San Diego was great. The, the thing I got out of it most, Dave, was, uh, was meeting a lot of the authors I had begun to have relationships with online. Yeah. Or social media and whatever, uh, and and certainly some authors that I I hadn't yet met uh, that way, but really kind of solidifying some friendships and talking about things and just sharing stories, um, and, and and that's been great. And and because of that, uh, I think you know all, all of the same people that you know in in this side of the business, the authors that that you've had on your show, so many of them I've be, I've gotten to know as well, and we pretty much talk all the time yeah. and, you know, ask questions and say, how are you doing this? And what are you working on? And, and that's been a wonderful kind of support group. That is so awesome. I love hearing that. And I, and it was so great to see you. Uh, often I hear people say this of me, but I always turn it around and go, man, it's just so cool to put a, you know, a face and a handshake to someone right. that you've been either looking through a screen at or reading about and so forth. So I thought it was really cool. My notes about Thriller Fest, everybody should do it once. Yeah. Everybody should do it once. Uh, beyond that, it's up to you. Uh, Bowser Khan, uh, that, was my, that was my first, and I, I totally enjoyed it. I will not be able to make the one this year in Nashville. Nashville. Yeah. For many reasons. And, uh, but I do like writer conferences in general. And Chris Hottie, my good buddy Chris Hottie and I were talking one day, and I think it was actually at the last... About, uh, Thriller Fest, and we were talking about the very best part is hanging out in the bar or the coffee shop, yeah, canoodling with other people, just shooting the breeze. And uh, there's something about that camaraderie and having people in your corner, and that you know that they're going through the exact same thing you're going through. And there's something really good about that. Right. And, and uh, the other thing that I did, um, similar to Bowser Khan, was because I was at Bowser Khan, I got invited to the Tucson Festival of Books, hmm. which, if you've never been to, is the most marvelous thing on the planet. Uh, and it happens every March, and I'm, I'm looking to go back. But I got to meet, again, tons more people, including the, uh, the very great Craig Johnson, the author of the Long Winter series. Wow. And he, I, I was able to personally thank him for blurbing the bitter past for me. And, uh, we talked about the book a little bit and he's the most gracious guy you'll ever meet. Very generous. We got to have dinner with him and, and, uh, just listen to him tell some stories about, uh, you know, his process and, and everything and saw him on a panel discussion. So it, it's just fabulous. Like a, there's like a hundred thousand people that turn out for this thing. What? Yeah. It's over, you know, several days and it's on the, it's in the quad of the university of Arizona. So they've got this huge setup and they, they get lots, tons of great authors and great panel discussions. It was amazing experience. Make sure you and I connect either offline after this or in between here and there, and I will meet you there for that. I would love to be at that gig. Oh, yeah, it is amazing. Yeah. I'm not even familiar with it, so that's actually. Oh, oh, yeah, look it up for sure. I'll send you some stuff on it. All right. Folks, let's take a short break. But when we come back, fun little thing, everything you want to know about Shades of Mercy from our friend Bruce Borges, and he's going to give us his secret sauce for creating genuine characters. Stay with us. And we're back with Bruce Borges, and of course, we're talking about this delicious book, Shades of Mercy. This is the follow-up to uh, The Bitter Past, and uh, thanks for sticking with us, buddy. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for having me again. 
All right, now I want us to drill down. Do you want to go A or B first? You want to go, let's drill down on Shades of Mercy. We're going to go there anyway. Or give me that secret sauce for creating genuine characters. And the reason I pick that for you, Bruce, is that this is what I feel about your characters. Much like Craig Johnson, who you referred right before the break with Longmire, which, God, I love that television series. Yeah, me too. Every time I read Porter Beck, I think of Longmire. I hope that's a compliment. It definitely is. So I have that same kind of a feeling, that same kind of a, that, you know, that voice that he has that just kind of a, you ain't, you're not going to mess me up. You're not going to rush me. I'm going to take care of this my way. And so I want to, which one do you want to go with? You want to, you want to no, talk? No, about let's, let's get the secret sauce stuff. All so, right. You know, similar to, and, and, and again, Craig Johnson has been one of the guys that I read extensively before I started to seriously do some writing and and Longmire was just a favorite character and I really admired how he he created not only Longmire but the characters around him and in a lot of ways I sometimes I kind of feel and I, I told Craig this that you know I, I've kind of copied him in some ways I mean I've created different characters in a different place but I try to emulate his the way he creates real, relatable characters. And, and Porter Beck, especially for me, is a character that when I, when I sit down and I do some writing and, I, and I'm you know, typing out what Porter Beck is saying or what he's doing, I look back on that, and not just with him, but with my other characters, and I, I say, is that really what this guy would do in this instance? Um, and, and I think I would be lying to you, David, if, if I said that there's not some of me in Porter Beck. Sure especially, you know, kind of sense of humor and things like that. And I, I think you have to impart part of you into at least your major characters. Otherwise, they're not real. You're, you're just trying to create something that um, you, you don't have any background in, you don't have any knowledge of. So, so I, I try to do those things where, I mean, my secret sauce, if there is any, is just in... Um, putting something down on paper that sounds like, hey, you know, this is, this is how a, a guy who's had 20 plus years in military intelligence would go about looking at the world. This is how a guy who um, isn't quite sure what his, without giving too much away about the bitter past, about what his real background is, you know, where he actually came from, the secrets in his life. This is, this is how a guy who has those questions views the world. So that's kind of what I, how I try to approach it. Well, and I love that because um, <clears throat> there's so many things. Um, there are so many times I will circle sometimes entire passages. Other times I'll just highlight a sentence that uh, struck me. You, you made a comment earlier. And I, I've had the same feeling, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners have, where you're like, oh, my, like, I think about this with Meg Gardner. I'm like, how how did she craft that sentence? She's, I mean, it's structure, it's words, it's, and sometimes it's with such little, what seems to be such little effort that makes me go, <laughs> all right, uh, I need to just think about something else. You know, I need to, I need to pick up another job. But then, but then listen to this, talking about this uh, imposter syndrome, talking to Don Winslow, I'm sure you heard this conversation, and he was saying, um, is it Richard Rousseau? He goes, yeah, I pick up one of his books and I read it and I go, and this is Don speaking, yeah, yeah. I, need, I need to just quit. I'm, I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it nice to hear when, you, when your heroes say something like that and you go, oh, you feel that way too? Yeah, there it is. In case you're wondering, you think I'm distracted. I'm not. I'm trying to find something that really... Okay. This is a couple of things. All right. Beck shook his head. That was a problem with drones. They were a gateway technology, opening the door for any country or any bad actor to weaponize artificial intelligence and execute lethal force while eating ice cream from the comfort of a recliner. A. Great line. Check. B. Talking about technology that's right here on the tip of everyone's tongue, B check. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that you 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 mentioned that or you read that quote because I was just before this we, we started the podcast. I'm typing up a, an article for Criminal Element, 
and I'm trying to relate to the reader there um, the interesting things I ran across in doing the research for this book and all of the information I found on hacking and the things that scared the absolute shit out of me about what really happens in the world. And I included that quote. Um, yeah, I was just, just looking at it before you and I started talking. Um, and I think, I think literally that um, when, I, when I wrote that, um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of came up with that when I was trying to describe what was going on in the book about these unmanned drones mm -hmm. and the fact that people can take them over at any time. And it, and it has happened, but it, it's terrifying. Yeah. And, and, and you can literally do it from the comfort of a recliner while you're eating ice cream. <laughs> it's a, for, for, for some of these people, it's a video game. Yes, it was. And that's exactly it. And it was the juxtaposition of the terror of artificial intelligence inside a drone uh, intercepting such and such, creating this havoc while well, sitting there eating some mint Oreo cookie. If right. you want to know my real secret passion. All right. <laughs> and then right here, as I flip the page, I'm just having fun with this. So thank you for bearing with me. Uh, Beck was blah, blah, blah. But something was wrong, as wrong as liver and onions. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and back to the secret sauce. Yeah. I think, again, I'm trying to come up with uh, a few good words and string together a few good sentences that are relatable to people. And so, so I, I, I thought I didn't want to write something cliche about as bad as, you know, whatever sure. uh, that people hear all the time. And I thought, well, what's bad to me? Yeah. And I just thought... I, you know, things like liver and onions are so wrong. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Well, the, the reason I circled that is I write, what, you don't like? I yeah. love liver and onions. Oh, so. yeah. oh my God, no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, there was one other one, and, I, and I've been flipping through it. I, evidently, I must not have had my highlighter in my hand when I said it. Usually, I will bend a corner, and then I'll come back and highlight it later. But it was something like this, and you'll you'll know what it is. So and so was as difficult as picking, folks. Bear with my language. Picking a piece of shit out of a fly's. Yeah, picking fly shit out of the pepper. Thank you. <laughs> now that right there, that's creating character. That is brilliant. That's hilarious. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. There are things like that that I, I, you know, when you write something like that, and you look back on it and you go, that, that's that's really good right there. You know, I mean, that's that's what you feel good about. And that's it's like the stupid game of golf. You know, you you're horrible at it. Most of us are horrible at it. But you go out there and you hit that one good shot a day and, and you go and that keeps you coming back. Right. It's enough to keep you coming back. Dude, dude, Mr. Dude to you. That is probably one of the best analogies I can think of right there, because I love golf. I've loved it yeah. since I was a kid. I'm not that great, but I'm OK. Yeah. Sure. I watch it on Sunday with my dad when he was alive. My wife and I watch it today. I get out and play whenever I can. And yes, one day you're out there banging them and you can't hit it to save your life. And you, and you want to throw or bend your clubs and go, why am I even doing this? Right. And then sure enough, somewhere on 13 or 15 or 17 or wherever, you hit that part. You, you connect perfectly. It, it goes straight down the fairway and you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll be back for this. That's right. That's exactly it. And and to extend the metaphor a little bit further, um, you know, you, you it's, the writing is is so similar to that because sometimes you're sitting there writing and you're going through like, uh, you know, I try to get through, I, I try to write like four to five hours a day. And sometimes, yeah, I'm not feeling it. Just like you're on the golf course. You're not, you're not hitting much of anything. But it's necessary to hit those shitty balls um, because occasionally you're going to get that swing just right. But if you don't hit the shitty balls or you don't type out the shitty words, you're not going to get the good one. I could not agree more. And as we continue to extend the metaphor, sometimes what I will do, and, and I think this is a good little trick. It's not a trick. I don't know if there's any real tricks. If I get stuck, uh, I'm in a passage, I'm, I'm two and a half hours in, and all of a sudden I hit one of those mental walls. I step up, I stand up, I put everything on pause, I go for a little short walk, get yep. a little oxygen, a little sun, 
clear my head, take the pressure off of myself to, to stop doing this, come sure. back, clicks right back in. That's it. Yep, totally. I do the same. Got to do it. Well, <clears throat> that's such a good analogy. I am so going to steal that. Um, you know, another thing about while we're talking about characters and why it's so, <clears throat> one of the things I liked about this book so much, you take your hero, and I always call the protagonist the hero because he's the hero in my world at that moment, right? So Porter sure. Beck is got a he's got a malady, something is broken in him. I want you to explain what it is and why. But it, when I read that the first time, I'm like, oh shit, that's 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 going to be challenging for him uh, in his line of work. And as then I picked up this book, I, I'm, I'm thinking of Bitter Past. Then I picked this book up, Shades of Mercy, and I'm like. Oh, it's progressed. How is Mr. Borges going to handle that? So talk to me about that. Yeah, so I wanted to give Porter um, some obstacles to overcome. And he's got a, you know, he's got a few things going on in his life. But I wanted to give him a physical malady. Um, and so what I came up with was a thing called retinitis pigmentosa which is commonly referred to as night blindness. Mm -hmm. But that's really a bit of a misnomer. Um, it's true that when the sun goes down, Porter Beck basically cannot see his, his vision. And this is a very real malady. Mm -hmm. His vision narrows to basically this pinprick of light in the center. Mm -hmm. And he really can't see anything else during daylight hours and under the sun in a hot, in a well-lit room. He's absolutely fine. But he has this malady that he has inherited genetically from his mother. Um, he just got the, the mutated gene that causes retinitis pigmentosa. And as you can imagine, as you've alluded to, being a law enforcement officer, it's not really um, the best when you can't see at night. Right. So I thought, and I, I thought about this ahead of time. Well, okay, first of all, this is a progressive disease. Mm -hmm. So over time, it, get, it gets worse. Porter got it much later in life, or he first started to realize the symptoms much later in life than most people who have RP actually do. But it's not completely uncommon for somebody in their 40s to start experiencing symptoms. For him, his disease is progressing pretty slowly. He doesn't know when he will eventually be blind all the time. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't know when that's going to happen. Nobody can tell him that. Mm -hmm. um, it could be five years from now. It could be 25 years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, a lot of that causes some apprehension for him. Imagine, you know, you're, you're home at night. You're trying to sleep. You can't see at all. Um, it throws off your, your day. Um, you're worried about it. You have nightmares about being blind. Um, these are very real experiences that people who have RP go through. Um, it's just that kind of not knowing what's, what's, what's oh no, down the road for me. What am I going to do about it? So Porter, being a law you know, he's a cop. He's a sheriff in a very remote county where he doesn't have a lot of tools to use. Now, what he, what he does, and I'll just kind of give a little bit away about Shades of Mercy, is I he's, love this. he's acquired a, uh, a dog, a uh, police dog, who, who kind of has flunked out at, uh, you know, uh, guns and ammo school, uh, where he might have sniffed out some things, although he's, he's competent in that. Um, but Porter's thinking, I mean, he picks him up for a song, literally a song, uh, while he's at a sheriff's conference. Um, and he has uh, decided that maybe I can train this guy to be a guide dog. He's got some skills. He's a police dog, you know. And, yeah, he's washed out of this, but maybe I can train him to do this. Now, he, Porter's the kind of guy, he's a, he's a you know, do-it-yourself guy. Sure. So he's figuring, I, I can do this on my own. And that, that has its own, you know, foibles and uh, failures uh, included in that. So it's it's an interesting disease for a guy, uh, a character like that to have. Yeah. Well, thank you for that explanation. I love it. And here's another thing about developing, and this is why I brought this up, the secret sauce about genu uh, genuine characters, is that uh, being a big dog lover as I am and having lost mine not that long ago, I 
am uh, attracted to any time a story has a dog in it, <clears throat> of course. Yeah. And so then this char- that dog has such character in and of himself, and I love that about that. And so, folks, if you want a great example of just building genuine characters, both uh, four-legged and two-legged, check out Shades of Mercy, of course. Um, as we start to wrap up, I, w- I want to drill down on one last thing because it's such a frightening... Um, <clears throat> It's such a frightening force in our world today and living here in San Diego. Right down the road, not very far from us, uh, lies a fair amount of Mexican cartel. So uh, I know that you have that influence in the book. So tell me your feelings about this. I know you got plenty of them. And what kind of research that you had to do uh, in order to really, again, make this so genuine. Well, part of the book is Porter Beck trying to figure out and solve for the opioid epidemic that is going on in his county. Even though it's a rural county, only has about 6,000 people, um, they're not immune to drugs and the, the impact and the effects that drugs have on, on its, its citizens there uh, and, and people that he knows and old friends of his people who are struggling with pain and things like that. And, and because now there is such an epidemic of fentanyl in the United States, that's very much uh, what he's really trying to get to the root of. Now, his problem is, is that a lot of this now, the, the transactions for these drugs is happening over the dark web. It's not, you know, you go to a, a seedy corner of town and, you know, pay some guy for this. It's you order them online, albeit on the dark web and it gets delivered to your house uh and there's no there's no good way to trace that stuff so that's a big part of the book and and because it is and as we know we all know that most of this fentanyl is coming up from the southern border in a variety of ways um and that the cartels are very much at the forefront here so it's a it's a piece that he has to deal with and has to be a part of this book. Along with that, as you know, um, it's not just the Mexican cartels. It is uh, another foreign government who is involved and, and, and specifically not perhaps on the drug side, but on, on the technology side, on the hacking side of things uh, that comes into play here. And all of those things kind of collide in the middle of this story. Yeah. Dude, it's so powerful, and it just shakes me to my core at what goes on around us. And Tammy and I talk about this, and I'm not beefing on San Diego because I we love it here for crying out loud. It's oh, yeah. <laughs> it's paradise. But yeah. what we are aware of is that there are so many things we are not aware of. I mean, this stuff is happening right around us. Maybe next door, maybe just down the street, maybe yes. across town. But it is it, it, it's it has a dark hand that is reaching out and touching a lot of people we know, and uh, what I'm afraid of is that there there won't be any end to it. And that's the killer. I know yeah. there's no there's no easy answer to it. That's for sure. It's yeah. you know as long as there's an appetite, it's going to be hard to suppress. Yeah. Well, as we wrap, you know what I always close with, and it may have changed since last time we spoke, but I'd love to hear Bruce's best writing advice. I think, and this is uh, you know, something you hear from so many writers, uh, my advice to writers is always two things. One is, as we talked about, believe in yourself. If, if, you, if you think, if you have the desire for this, um, nobody was born Stephen King, nobody was born John Steinbeck. They, they worked their asses off to get you know, that recognition and to get that acclaim. Um, and I'm sure they have all the same self-doubts that the rest of us have as writers. So that's my first piece of advice is believe in yourself, do something about it. And, um, and then get into the habit of writing. As I said, um, I try to write four or five hours a day, you know, six to seven days a week, much to the chagrin of my wife, (laughs) because technically I'm supposed to be retired now, but now I'm not retired. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good thing. But um, getting into that habit um, allows you as a writer to, uh, and I tell people this all the time, what do you, they say, what do you do about writer's block? I said, I've never, ever had writer's block. Because I will sit down and I will just start typing 
what I, you know, something that is related to the outline that I've created for a story. And it may be absolute crap. It may be junk. But by type getting into the, the, the rhythm of a few paragraphs, I, I find that, okay, then things kind of start to click. And I can always throw out the crap later on. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and I do. In, in all of the subsequent drafts that I do. You don't need to be perfect uh-huh. in your first draft. Just get into the habit of writing, uh, you know, whether it's the same time every day or the same amount of time every day, and good things will happen. So good. Was it Voltaire who said uh, perfection is the enemy of good? You, you would know. Okay. All right. The other thing is, since we spent so much time talking about golf, and I hope you play golf because we're going to do that one day. Do you, by the way? You know, I yeah, I I, I tell people I hack around. Okay. Uh, my okay. back is not what it used to be, so I I have a very limited backswing, but which probably serves to give me a better score. Yeah. Well, my point is this, uh, and I was thinking about this when I watched a Tiger Woods documentary. Since we're hammering on golf, do you think? Do you think Tiger Woods just woke up one day and said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to try this and see if I'm any good? No, he practiced his work ethic for practice is insane. And I read and I heard on this documentary, I think he will not leave his practice until he strikes the ball 1000 times every day. That's minimum. Yeah. And when I heard that, I'm like. Wow, that takes that 10,000 hour rule to a whole right. new level. But the the key is, folks, in case you haven't heard it and figured it out by now, just sit down, give yourself permission, be kind to yourself, do that which you love, keep right. going. If yep. it sucks, scratch it. But if you ha- if you've written nothing, then you have nothing to correct, right? right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Bruce, uh, it is always such a good time. Uh, I loved seeing you at Basher Khan. I I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to uh, hook up. Uh, this particular time in person, I promise you in season seven, which is launching uh, season seven. Can you believe it? We'll launch. Wow, that's great. In September. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, because uh, daddy's taking vacation time. This this, Good deal. this summer will be the first time I've taken vacation. I shit you not since I started working at 16. Oh, my God. Are you kidding no, I have worked. I have just hammered my whole professional career, my second career. Now in my third career, I've worked every summer. And this summer, I'm taking July and August, or at least August for sure, off. Good for and, you. Yeah. Folks, once again, you want to know more, go to BruceBorges.com. Pick up Shades of Mercy. You will not be disappointed. I promise you, this is one of those reads, and it feels like an old friend. Craig Johnson influence. I love the fact that he's right at the top saying a crisp jolt of cask strength, 100 proof writing. He's a good guy. Bam. Well, Bruce is always delightful. Always good to see him. Thank you, my friend. Great seeing you all. We'll miss you at Bowser Khan. Yes, but I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll catch another conference and go get your checkup. Yeah, go on. And uh, we will talk more about that book that I have in the uh, back burner Uh, very soon. But again, folks, it's Bruce Borges. Be well, my friend. All right. Thanks, David. Thanks, Bruce. Always good fun with you. And as promised, folks, if you want to hear just a couple more minutes that were originally recorded during our warm-up period, right there just before the show, stay with me just a couple more minutes, and I think you'll be inspired. Here's Bruce and my conversation that was being recorded, and it has to do with my recent bout with prostate cancer and some of the questions he has. So if this interests you, stay with us. And if not, I'll see you next week for another edition of The Thriller Zone. And always thank you for your support. This is not a day that somebody wants to fuck with me because I just got out of radiation treatment for the... Fuck, what day is this today? Yeah. What is that for? Oh, I got prostate cancer, dude. Dude, I am going to the doctor in a couple of weeks, uh, and I am fearing that that might be the case with me. Talk to me. Why do you I fear mean, it? Well, you know, it's just uh, I have a lot of symptoms <laughs> And I'm 60. I'll be 65 next month. Um, I, I just, and my, my dad had it. So, um, you know, we're going to run the tests and see what comes up. 
Well, I'm going to spend one minute here on this, folks, because this is important to me. Um, I was one of those guys that said, yeah, I don't want to go to the doctor to get that test that none of us guys like. Right. right. And and I don't have it in my family. And I work out and I eat well and I'm in shape and all that stuff mm-hmm. until one day I go, OK, Tammy says, why don't you go to my specialist just do a run a blood test just to check things out. And the number had sky PSA had skyrocketed. So I'm afraid of that, too. Yeah. So long story short, uh, Doc says, dude, uh, you went from a six. You know, you went from a three, six to a nine in like a year that should not have that should take you right. about 20 years to do right long story short i had the surgery took he it did. out he's high-fiving us how oh, we got everything everything looks good we'll see in three months it's gonna be routine three months later he goes uh it's back so what it did is either he didn't get it all or a uh, little fella jumped the uh, ropes yeah. and headed north. And so, yeah, I am. Um, oh, hold, watch this. Uh, this. This tells you my life. <clears throat> oh, boy. I have uh, nine more days after today of radiation. Yeah. And that's not so bad. Oh, although, that's good. Although it, it Fs with your machine downstairs. Sure. But it's the hormone therapy that they give you to stop the testosterone. Right. The hot flashes, my wife and I are now having competitions for hot flashes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope hope that works out for you. I mean, I know that's my best friend just went through the same thing last year. So. Yeah, it's... uh... Hey, Nietzsche said it didn't. If it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Now, if I break out into a big sweaty mess and I and you just see dripping, it's just a hot flash. I'm Got really it. okay. All right, Bruce, you're not making me nervous. Yeah, okay. Mr. Borges. Yeah, we're we're actually rolling. I'm I may or may not keep that in. I don't know. I'll I'll figure okay. that out. But. Uh, if you're cool with it. Uh, yeah. for, let me say this, though. I wish you well. I, I hope it turns out positively, negatively. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Positively, yeah. negatively. And, uh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a little older than you, so uh, I've, I've passed that number. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I'm here's the good news, Bruce, if I may, for one more second. I'm writing mm-hmm. a book about it, a nonfiction book. Oh, good. Good. Because I want to challenge guys just like you, just like me, just like yeah. buddies of mine who are a decade younger. I want to go, hey, oh, you don't like that little inconvenience for 15 minutes? Well, yeah. let me tell you what the alternative is. That's right. Yep, exactly. All right. Now, here's the official start to the Thriller Zone. Well, thanks once again to Bruce Borges for letting me rattle on about that. But it is an important topic. It has affected me. It is affecting uh, Bruce. It affects a lot of men. And uh, I'm happy to share more about that in upcoming episodes, either here or maybe on another podcast, we'll just say. All right. I'm David Temple, your host. I'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone, your front row seat to the best thriller writers in the world.